Hatchberg. I'm the executive director of Ollie, and I just want to welcome you all to our winter 2013 semester. At this point, I would like to introduce to you Art Sherman, who is the chair of our social science curriculum committee and the person who puts together so many of these wonderful courses and finds instructors and does such a wonderful job. And he will be introducing Stacy. Good afternoon, everybody, and, and, and welcome. Uh, the course is uh, Eisenhower, a successful president or a uh, moral failure. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be said about this president uh, before and after, but uh, we're very fortunate to uh, have Stacy Wallach lead us in this course. <coughs> the uh, heavy registration is uh, an indication <laughs> of the well-deserved and the very high esteem that uh, the membership holds uh, Casey, uh, uh, Stacy. Uh, he's lectured on so many occasions for us on so many important subjects, and he's a very important contributor to our social science subcommittee. Stacy received his LLB from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. He's an adjunct professor at Pace University Law School and a retired senior managing director at CB uh, Richard Ellis, and he's a former New York City business trial lawyer. And aside from all of that, uh, he's been busily collecting a huge supply of very valuable Ali mugs. <laughs> it's my pleasure to add to uh, his collection. <laughs> all right. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to you all. Uh, I notice a lot of familiar faces, and for that I'm very, very grateful. I'm delighted to uh, uh, have you back. Uh, about the only drawback of this particular audience vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Eisenhower's presidency is that I can see that other than Art and myself, none of you are old enough to even remember <laughs> Eisenhower. Speak for yourself. <laughs> uh, and one of the nice things about um, looking at Eisenhower's presidency uh, is how, just in our lifetimes, how remarkably different the historical view and views of him are. Uh, and it, uh, I'm just going to spend a second on reminding us that whenever you read a history book, uh, you really have to look at who the author is and when she or he wrote the book and uh, what uh, acts he or she had to grind because uh, historical views uh, change dramatically over time of what you would think are objective events. But in fact, our understanding of uh, human actors in historical events and the events themselves uh, change a great deal with the passage of time. And Eisenhower's presidency is a perfect example of that. Uh, now, just um, uh, a, a housekeeping item or two. The uh, course is about the presidency. 19, well, he was elected in November of 52 and was inaugurated in January of 53, uh, left office in January of 60. Um, so the course is going to focus on the presidency. But in this lecture, I'm going to try to give you a broad brush uh, pictorial view of who Eisenhower was from his birth up until he became the president. Because uh, I, I'm guessing you'll all agree with me that to really understand what was going on in his presidency, uh, you have to understand who the man was. And to do that, you have to understand where he was born and raised and where he came from and what his life experiences were. So uh, the next five classes after this, I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions. And because uh, we're all pretty much friends in this room, uh, uh, I'm going to encourage you to raise your questions, your comments, your disagreements as I speak, or towards the end of the lecture, as you prefer. Uh, uh, hopefully, as a result of our past uh, classes together, you're not shy anymore. <laughs> Today, though, uh, it's so jam-packed 
that I am going to go roaring through this extraordinary life. Um, and we'll see if we have time at the end. Uh, indeed, uh, you may have to write down your questions and ask me the next time, because this is a jam-packed uh, class. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we're going to start with the syllabus. Now, I have a feeling you all uh, have this, right? So you can see we're going to talk about uh, war and peace. We are going to have it in just a moment. Ah, there it is. <laughs> the secret sauce is being brewed in the back of the room. But as you can see, I've selected um, five specific topics, and then we're going to have on February 21 uh, an attempt to wrap up and really look at uh, Eisenhower's legacy. And quite frankly, uh, in class number six, I fully expect many of you to contribute as much uh, as I do, because by the time we get there, we'll all have a pretty thorough understanding of what happened and what didn't happen. About the only thing I'll say about the topics is that as broad and as deep as they are, uh, there's plenty we're not going to talk about. Uh, it was eight action-packed years, and in uh, five classes, you know, we're not going to cover everything. So, Eisenhower's hometown, and I put th those two words in quotes, as you'll see in a moment. Eisenhower's hometown was uh, Abilene, Kansas. Uh, but he wasn't actually born there. He was born in Denison, Texas. His family was rooted in Abilene, but his father had what I would call a nervous breakdown and uh, uh, lost his uh, store in Abilene. And for a few years, they moved to Denison, Texas. That's happened, that happened to be the, the uh, period when Ike was born. But by the time he was two or three, they were back in Abilene again. And if you asked Ike at any time in his life, what's your hometown, Mr. Eisenhower? Or as we would say, General Sir. <laughs> uh, he would say Abilene. He grew up in Abilene. He returned to Abilene where his parents lived until they were quite old. He thought of Abilene as his hometown. And curiously enough, he was born in 1890. So whenever you pick a uh, end of a decade that ends with a zero in the 20th century, and you want to know how old Ike was in 1940, just add 10 years. You know, he was 50 years old in 1940. You got that. <laughs> it, curiously enough, 10 years before he was born, Abilene was still a Wild West cow town. It was the northern terminus of the Chisholm Trail, which was the trail that Texas cattlemen used to drive their cattle north to Abilene, where they could get on uh, a train and be shipped, that is the cows, could be shipped <laughs> north to St. Louis, where there were big stockyards, and then, and then east, and north to Chicago, and then shipped east from there. But if you look at the couple of scenes I'm going to show you, it looks a lot to me like photographs I've seen of Pittsfield, Massachusetts in 1900. Uh, it was not a hamlet like where I live today, it was a, um, you know, by the standards of the time, a small city, very small, but not a rural setting. There were rural areas that you could walk to, for, you know, from the edge of town, but it was a, um, you know, an urban environment. Uh, their hotel on the left, and I'm not kidding, on the right, uh, that was, in fact, the equivalent of the Mahewi, built a built around the same time. Uh, my daughter runs a uh, children's theater program in uh, the Tarrytown Music Hall in Westchester County, built at the same time, looks just like that. Uh, it was part of the uh, cultural uh, background in which uh, Eisenhower grew up. Uh, the drugstore on the left, which I'll bet you anything was a speakeasy uh, in the 20s and a uh, women's uh, uh, clothing store on the right. Uh, the uh, creek 
uh, where everybody went skating in the winter and swimming in the summer. Uh, and uh, then, you know, after Eisenhower was already gone, uh, got replaced by this fabulous uh, modern facility. And here's the um, family tree. The important part is that they had been in America for a long time. 1741 on his father's side and just about the same, 1751 on his mother's side. And uh, the two families finally conjoined down here. And uh, 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 here we've got uh, Ike's mother and father. And he had five brothers. And I'll jump ahead uh, and give you uh, his mother's famous comment uh, after he became a five-star general of the armies. They flew a guy down, a, a correspondent down to Abilene and said, well, Mrs. Eisenhower, what do you think of your boy? And she said, which one? <laughs> because they were all, they were all successful. They were, they were all successful. Uh, we need to know a little about um, the mother and the father. The, um, they were both intensely religious people. They were not... Uh, they did not feel comfortable in the conventional Christian uh, religions like uh, Methodist or Catholic or Protestant or Catholic. They weren't comfortable there. They were more like the early Puritans that came to Massachusetts. Uh, they were, um, uh, in fact, ultimately, each of them, the, the father and the mother, ended up in slightly different sects, uh, both very Christian, but very Puritan, small p, uh, and very intense. They were both uh, uh, against war. Uh, his mother was a pacifist. Uh, one of Ike's brothers said, the only, time she ever, the only time that he, the brother, ever heard his mother cry was the night that Ike went off to West Point. Uh, but she didn't stand in his way. Uh, they uh, came from a uh, very modest economic background, and it got more modest after their marriage because, as I say, David, the father, had, and I'm using this in a non-technical way, the equivalent of a, of a nervous breakdown. He had a partner in a store, and the store went bust, and he took the family to Denison, Texas, and worked for the railroad in a fairly menial capacity. And finally, uh, an uncle of his went down to visit and discovered that they were living really uh, in desperate poverty. Brought the family back to Abilene, got David a job at the creamery that the uncle owned and ran. And they lived a little better. And then as times went on, they, they became never rich or even, you wouldn't even call it middle class, but they, they became, you know, a little more comfortable. Uh, we'll see in a moment. Uh, here is David and Ida. She was much more upbeat, and Eisenhower has a lot to thank uh, for his mother's uh, upbeat, exuberant, outgoing personality. Uh, his father was really depressive. Uh, not a bad or evil man, not at all, but just depressed. Uh, it was, you know, a man who was in desperate need of Prozac. Um, here's four of the Eisenhower brothers, and guess who? And you're going to see something that had a very major role in Eisenhower's life that you might or might not see right here. And I'll get to it in a minute. This is their first home when they came back from Denison. And this is three of his six brothers. <coughs> five, five, five. It said three of his six. Ah, uh, I can't explain that. I thought, I thought they were a total of six. Okay. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's a total of six. Okay. It's Ike plus five. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is Ike. Uh, and uh, despite the fact that in this photograph, uh, it looks like a nice little house, th this wasn't a nice little house. Uh, and here is uh, Ike in the second grade. Look at this kid. You know, <laughs> you know why? Because Eisenhower, one second before the photograph was taken, it just goosed him. Right? <laughs> and I'm not kidding. 
Eisenhower was born with a violent temper, and his mother came down on him a hundred times like a ton of bricks, and he learned by the time he went off to West Point to control it, but it never disappeared. And indeed, in the Army and in his presidency, he was prone to fits of rage when things didn't go the way he wanted. And his family, I'm using that in the capital F, his colleagues and associates uh, and adoring uh, worshipers uh, protected uh, uh, the public uh, from knowing about that. Uh, just like, you know, uh, Kennedy uh, tried to hide the fact that he loved cigars and that he had a terrible back. Uh, Eisenhower tried to disguise the fact that he had a violent temper uh, and used it occasionally very effectively. Uh, but here, you can already see he was, he was a wild kid uh, and very bright. And we're going to talk about that because my guess is that there are plenty of people in this audience who remember an old sickly Eisenhower who seemed like he couldn't get the grammar of English straight. You know, forget it. This is a very bright guy who used that for his own purposes. So, uh, uh, his mother really uh, was the shaping influence in his life. Here he is at age 12 with his five brothers. Uh, this is the one you probably know best, Milton, because he went on. But each, uh, Ed, Edgar, Earl, Arthur, and Roy, each went on to very, very successful uh, uh, life careers. Only one of them was divorced. Uh, and uh, uh, it's really remarkable because you are talking about uh, uh, a group, a family, that came from truly, truly limited circumstances in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it is no slur on Kansas to say that in 1900 and 1910, Abilene was nowhere. <laughs> Particularly after the cattle drives ended, you know, it just sat there with no real reason for existence. Here's the home they moved into after they uh, got resettled and, and uh, David started doing better at the dairy. Really, his family, his brothers and uncles, I'm talking about Ike's father, they really um, succored him, you know, uh, made him more comfortable than he could on his own. Uh, so this house, which is also quite modest, uh, someone who was just telling me before the class began that they visited the house, and it's, it's very simple, very down to earth. Uh, yeah, very small, and a lot of people in that family. Um, uh, here he is as a teenager camping out. Uh, what's this in his hand? No, it's, it's lemonade, of course. <laughs> Here's another shot of him. And what you're starting to see is what I alluded to before, and you're going to see more of it. When he was, when he was, he was a cute kid, right? Yeah. Now he's getting to be quite tall. And you're going to see more of him. His graduation picture. He was, uh, despite almost losing his leg to a virulent infection, in fact, the doctors were ready to cut, and uh, Eisenhower uh, absolutely refused. Uh, he was a real football standout in high school uh, and um, uh, went off to West Point. Uh, and the first thing he did was join the football team, but we'll, we'll see more of that. The family was so stretched financially that uh, initially they couldn't send him to college, although ultimately all of, he and all of his brothers did go to college. Here's the creamery, uh, and uh, here's Ike hard at work in the creamery after uh, graduation from high school. And you can see um, uh, it's the turn of the century, right? Uh, and uh, uh, here he is, a working man uh, with his parents and uh, uh, Milton and Earl. Uh, the, um, it was unclear yet what direction he was going to go in. He did not have any natural affinity for the military. This did not um, uh, 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 loom large in his consciousness. He ultimately... 
uh, applied to the U.S. Naval Academy and West Point for one very simple reason. They were free. <laughs> and he was very, very bright, uh, got good uh, grades, and he felt that he had a good shot at getting a senatorial appointment. Now, here's an interesting thing that not a lot of people know about, and which, but for my wife, the psychotherapist, I would dismiss. <laughs> but I've learned to my sorrow <laughs> not to dismiss her insights. He lied to get into West Point. And you may say, oh, well, it's a little lie. What was the lie? He lied about his age because initially, he, and this is curious, here he is in the middle of Kansas, and he applied initially to the Naval Academy. <coughs> And he had a lie on his application because uh, there was a window of time in which, uh, an age window in which you could apply and if you were below it or above it, they wouldn't accept your application. And he was already above it. So he lied on his Navy application uh, by saying he was a year younger than he was. Remember he had spent two years working after high school. And then when he didn't get the appointment, he was number two, he was the runner-up for the appointment. But that gave him some uh, encouragement. And so the next year he applied, or actually six months later, he applied to West Point. He lied again. Now maybe he lied thinking, well, if I've already put down that I'm XYZ, I better stick with XYZ. Uh, even though he was within West Point's window, he still lied. And my wife would say, you have just seen a little window open up into his soul. <laughs> and I have had a few experiences that have taught me not to ignore uh, things like that. Uh, so uh, he was having a good time uh, uh, in those years. Here's a wolf hunt. Uh, and I apologize. Some of these early pictures, I, it was impossible for me to get high res, high resolution. And I apologize for that. I figured you'd rather see it fuzzy than not see it at all. Now this you gotta look closely at. Can you see Ike with his hands up? Uh, right? Target practice? Here's his, hand, here's his right hand, right? Just kidding around out on the plains. He loved fast cars, loved them all his life. Uh, the, um, and here he is, I, I have no idea who took this picture. Here he is in Chicago on his way to matriculating at West Point. Uh, and what you're starting to see is he's not just a cute kid anymore. He's a gorgeous young man. And in fact, he was a ladies man all his life. All his life. <laughs> He gets to West Point, and he's uh, on the varsity his first year, and at the end of the season, the, well, the fact is that he uh, injured his knee so terribly that it ended his football career. The story, which I don't believe for a second, is uh, for those of you uh, who are football aficionados of a certain age, <laughs> he was trying to tackle the great Native American football player, Jim Thorpe, and took a, a knee in the knee. Uh, but you can see that um, uh, it really had a terrible impact on him. He really became depressed and uninterested. Uh, he was so smart that he ended up, uh, by the way, I gotta, before I say where he ended up, here he is. And remember, this is the class they entered uh, West Point in 1911. They graduated in 1915. It was called the Class of Stars because more generals emerged from this class than any other because they got to fight in both World War I, World War II, and the Korean War. Uh, and a lot of generals came from this. But who is this? Anybody want to take a guess? Douglas MacArthur. No. Uh, MacArthur, interestingly enough, it was almost 10 years earlier. Almost 10 years, I think a full 10 years earlier. Who? Patton. Patton. Marshall? No. Oh, Patton's, a, uh, I think, five or six years older. Uh, Marshall. Marshall's 10 years older. 
uh, Omar Bradley. Who said Omar Bradley? Raise your hand. <laughs> All right, there's my man right there. This is Omar Bradley. Arguably the most accomplished of the American generals. And, and that's saying something because Patton was an extraordinary combat general. But Patton was of a narrower focus. Omar Bradley was the cat's meow. <laughs> he graduated in the middle of his class, which gives no hint of his actual uh, intelligence. And in deportment, when I say at the very bottom, I mean literally at the bottom. Uh, he was, as you can tell from this glorious little smile, in addition to being a handsome young man, uh, he was a, um, a devil. <coughs> he was a devil. Uh, he helped pay for his um, uh, you know, uh, pocket money by playing poker. And he got so good at it that later on, as a young lieutenant in an army base, uh, he had to stop playing poker because he took everybody's money 100% all the time. Uh, and uh, it became an issue. You know. uh, but he, he, was a, um, he was a playboy. Uh, and then, in 1916, he met uh, a rather, uh, you know, uh, yeah? Yeah, that's not, that's not your picture of her, is it? Yeah. <laughs> you thought he married the person you knew. No, 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 no. She had a lot of pizzazz, a lot of pizzazz. And um, she came from a, I wouldn't call it wealthy, but a very comfortable, very comfortable, just a, uh, more than just upper middle class, you know, uh, like a half a step above economically uh, from a very close-knit family in Denver. Um, and uh, they fell in love very quickly. Um, and uh, uh, he was attracted by, uh, you know, her um, very outward, upbeat, bubbly personality. Uh, what he didn't understand was that she wasn't a real outdoors girl. She looked like a real outdoors girl, uh, which he was very much an outdoors guy. And ultimately, later in their marriage, that, that was a real drag on the relationship because uh, uh, she liked uh, indoor activities more. Uh, this, for some reason, I, maybe somebody can explain that to me. It looks like on the steps of uh, uh, someplace in Moscow. Doesn't he look like, <laughs> did you see, what was that uh, movie with uh, Dr. Zhivago? Doesn't this look like uh, something? Uh, and here came, uh, just the worst tragedy of all. Now, I don't have to explain to you that losing a three-year-old is devastating, and you never recover from it. Uh, after his presidency, when he was writing his memoirs uh, and, and was uh, working with uh, uh, a couple of people to uh, get it down, uh, he broke into tears just, you know, because he had to talk about uh, Little Ikey. Uh, little Ikey was... Uh, three and a quarter years old when uh, he died. So, you know, he had a fully formed little personality. Uh, and Ike, well, both of them, Ike and Mamie, uh, doted on him. And you can see that, I mean, you can't fake that. That's a uh, rambunctious little happy child. And the death, which was very, very sudden, uh, just devastated them. And as you probably know, uh, often a common tragedy like that can actually drive the parents apart. Uh, sometimes it brings them closer together, but sometimes it drives them apart. And from what I can tell, that's what happened with Mamie and Ike during the 1920s. Um, Captain Eisenhower is put in charge of a cross-country convoy. You're going to see the roads they went on. This is the birth of the interstate highway system. <laughs> Uh, and that's no joke. This is where, this personal experience, and I'm going to show you pictures in a second, is what led him to put all of the force of his popularity and his political clout into creating the interstate highway system. Uh, 
Uh, this was one of the good roads. <laughs> Right, here they are in Dodge. The, uh, some of the pictures that really show what are literally just cow paths didn't have a high enough resolution for me to get them up on the screen. But going from coast to coast, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, the roads were just ghastly. It was, you know, it was just awful. Uh, he actually thought, uh, oh, so before I get to this point, he graduates in 1915. All the really lucky second lieutenants are sent off to France to the war to create their uh, notches on their rifle butts and start their upward career paths. They thought that Eisenhower was brilliant at training people and they didn't send him overseas. He spent most of the, of the American participation in the war finagling and maneuvering and trying to get himself sent overseas. Never happened and that's why uh, he really thought about leaving the army because when peace broke out, remember, World War I was the war to end all wars, right? People believed that, and he couldn't see any future for himself. And then he uh, met George Patton, who had been overseas, and they got interested in tanks, and all of a sudden Eisenhower got sort of a new lease on uh, enthusiasm about uh, the war, about uh, the army, and he decided to stay in, much to the chagrin of Mamie and her family who thought, here's this bright, good-looking uh, uh, guy. What is he wasting his time in the army? Uh, I've heard that. Uh, uh, and he finally gets sent to France, and, and uh, he started to get lucky at this point, lucky in the sense of being assigned to mentors, senior army brass, one after another after another, who really made his career. And, and it was such a succession of lucky breaks that people started calling him Lucky Ike. Uh, and on the um, right we have Blackjack Pershing, uh, who was a, uh, for the next 20 years, uh, was a guy pushing Ike's uh, reputation. And this guy, General Fox Connor, was probably the single most important influence. He was assigned Connor. Uh, who at that time was a two-star general, uh, was assigned to uh, the Panama Canal Zone, took Ike with him as his chief uh, assistant, and essentially put him through a graduate course in the humanities. They started with the ancient Greeks, and he forced him to read through what you would call a graduate humanities degree. And it changed Eisenhower's life. It, because suddenly he became not some kid from Abilene who graduated from West Point. He became a far more sophisticated, educated guy. And Connor was known for, he, Connor was referred to as the Army's intellectual. Uh, and it was uh, Connor <coughs> who reached out to get him and then to push his career uh, in the future. And he was critical in that way. The only thing that wasn't so good was uh, that Mamie went down and the living conditions in the Panama Canal Zone in the 20s, yeah. Yeah. ghastly. Yeah. So she was pregnant by this time with her son John and went home. Used the baby as an excuse to just walk away from Ike and went back to Denver. Uh, and uh, the marriage could have ended there, could have ended there. This is a very rare photograph. Uh, I, got a, I got a hold of it just by accident. This is Connor, General Connor. This is Captain Eisenhower. The troops are all lined up over here. Uh, and uh, here's John, their, their son, uh, at age six. Uh, and uh, he uh, had a, to say that he had a difficult childhood, I mean, he was an army brat. His parents were constantly on the move. They were, the parents were often separated. Uh, the, Eisenhower had not really recovered at all from the death of little Ike. It was very hard for him to warm up to his second son. Years after Eisenhower's death in 69, they were interviewing John, who went on to become a, uh, 
a brigadier general, he did have substantial frontline combat experience. I mean, substantial. And then he became a military historian. They're interviewing him. And he says, well, because they're asking him, well, you know, we've heard your relationship with your father growing up. It was very difficult. And he said, well, you know, there's that part of him, there's that big smile, you know. <laughs> then there's the part of him that's ice cold. <laughs> and there was a dead silence. The other fellow didn't say a word. And finally, John looked up and said, yeah, about 85% ice cold. <laughs> and that's something we have to take into account uh, as we assess uh, Eisenhower. Here he is back at home in 1926 with his brothers. Here's Ike, of course, his mother and his father. Uh, look very nice, you know, nice, solid, substantial people. You notice Mamie is not there. And in those years, she was simply not uh, very uh, happy and with good reason. She had lost a baby. What could, I mean, you're not going to be prancing around in joy. And uh, Ike was uh, largely unavailable. I think 50% uh, because he was being shuttled around the country and, and to places like Panama. Um, uh, and was unavailable you know, because of his military uh, duties. And 50% because he was emotionally unavailable uh, for a variety of reasons. But to show you just how smart he was, first, not top 10 or top 10 percent, first. Uh, you don't get to be first at uh, the Commander General Staff College unless you're very, very smart. But because of the peacetime army, he got stuck. And I mean, he really got stuck, particularly because he didn't have any combat experience. He hadn't been in France during the war. And then he gets another lucky break. Uh, MacArthur picks him, who's now Army Chief of Staff, uh, picks him first to be uh, uh, his senior aide, and then he takes him to the Philippines. In 1935, finally, the Philippines became independent. They had been a sort of protectorate uh, since 1902 when the United States took it away from Spain, uh, actually in the War of 1898, but then there was, uh, we'll skip over that. <laughs> when they become independent, truly independent in 35, the Philippine government hires MacArthur to turn their army into a, an effective fighting force. MacArthur is given a special leave of absence from the US Army and signs a contract uh, with the Philippine government and becomes their uh, army chief and lives like an imperial Caesar. I mean, really, truly like an imperial Caesar. Uh, uh, and stays overseas, by the way, until he came back in, uh, you know, after Truman fired him in 51. He had been out of the country since uh, 34 or 35. Uh, he, he was as out of touch with the United States as you could possibly be. But the result was that he saw his role in such imperial uh, dimensions that Eisenhower, in effect, became the CEO of the, he, uh, MacArthur was like the chairman of the board. He's like the CEO of the Philippine Army. And what you're starting to see by this point is Eisenhower's emergence as a guy who knew how to plan and organize. And uh, he had a series of assignments in which these skills were honed to a very, very high degree, and also to mediate between <coughs> MacArthur and the senior officials of the Philippine government. So what you're seeing is the emergence uh, of a planner, an organizer, and a mediator among the Hottentots, you know, the high uh, brass, both political and civilian. And that becomes the key to his later career. Uh, here's the family Eisenhower in um, the Philippines, and for the first time, they lived in a little luxury. Nothing like the MacArthur's, of course, but for the first time, uh, the family started to have a fairly pleasant domestic life. Uh, and uh, in early 41, early 41, the war, of course, in Europe broke out in September of 39, uh, but we're not yet involved. Uh, the army, uh, believing that 
eventually America is going to be involved, uh, starts to have extensive war maneuvers. Ike is one of a number of people uh, invited to take charge of a particular, quote, army, unquote, in these maneuvers. And it turns out he excels. Why does he excel? Because what he's superb at is planning and organizing. And in war games, that counts for a lot. Uh, in fact, he defeated all of these other army leaders who were vastly superior to him in rank. Uh, and that stood out. Uh, and uh, he, uh, a guy named McNair, a four-star general named McNair, took him under his wing. Uh, and once again, Eisenhower had a mentor who pushed him. Uh, and here, he meets the ultimate mentor, yeah. George Marshall, uh, U.S. Army Chief of Staff, and probably the least understood and most important uh, figure, both military and uh, political, in the 20th century. Uh, just a remarkable man, but that's another course for another time. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, Marshall's boss was uh, Henry Stimson. Now, what's interesting here is Eisenhower, uh, uh, Marshall, and Stimson, they're all working for Roosevelt. Uh, you know, the, the heart and soul of Eisenhower's upward career thrust was under Eisenhower and Truman, uh, despite the fact that uh, Roosevelt and Truman, sorry. And Eisenhower uh, made a point of saying, I'm not political. Uh, he never registered as a Republican or a Democrat. He never voted. And he made a point of, I'm, I'm not political. In fact, through all of this, the end result was, using the word political with a small p, he became incredibly skillful politically, uh, mediating between people like Marshall, Stimson, FDR, etc. Uh, and that became his great strength. Uh, Marshall uh, promotes him. He's fine. In early 42, he finally gets to be a colonel. This is early 42. <laughs> you know, this is right after uh, Pearl Harbor. He finally makes it out of being a major. Uh, and he very quickly moves from being part of the uh, Marshall's uh, war planning unit to becoming chief of his war plans division. That took about 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, and reported directly to Marshall, and then also directly to the Joint Chiefs, uh, who you see here, who have all passed into history, but they were very important people in their time. And finally, and this is the critical turning point, Marshall uh, sends Ike to London with a group because it's very clear in, by March of 1942, when he first sends him over, that the entire American uh, command structure in London is in total disarray. The people there are the wrong people. They don't know what they're doing. They're disorganized. So who does Marshall send? Mr. Organization. He sends Ike. Uh, to London. Now, Eisenhower says he truly didn't know this. He thought he was being sent there to listen, analyze, and report. Of course, Marshall was a chess player and thought six moves ahead. And he, was, he had, as part of the report that he was required to give to Marshall, Marshall had told him, describe for me, both generically and in detail, the type of officer we need to run the American war effort from London. <laughs> and Eisenhower apparently, apparently, very innocently, laid out A, B, C, D, E, and Marshall took one look and said, you be the man. <laughs> so in June, actually in, in March, uh, when he first went over, who shows up at the airport? Uh, the British send a chauffeur. Perfectly innocent. That's her, uh, Miss Summersby. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was just innocent. Uh, for, for its, uh, yeah, well, it was innocent for at least the first 15 minutes. <laughs> and uh, when he goes back in June, because Marshall has now selected him to be the uh, commander in chief of the American Armed Forces in, uh, based in London, uh, she doesn't show up at the airport, and he says, Where's my chauffeur? And the British, who are no dummies, say, oh, she'll be there very shortly. <laughs> and uh, she shows up first as a secretary, 
then as his administrative assistant, and then as his aide de camp. Uh, in fact, over the next four years, wherever Ike went, Miss Summersby went. And she must have been very good at it. Because, <laughs> no, 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 no. All right, so we'll, put, we'll take all of your cynicism and put it in a little basket and say, you know, this is now. But that was then. He was a very demanding taskmaster with a violent temper, and she managed him as well as he managed the army. Uh, she was very good at her job. Uh, and she became his hostess at dinner parties uh, and his date on evenings out and his vacation companion. Uh, and, um, they both love to play golf. Well, Kay to play golf too. Uh, Ike loved to ride horseback. Kay loved to ride horseback. Ike loved to fish. Kay said she loved to fish. Ike loved to play fiercely competitive bridge. Remember, he, he had had to give up poker because he was too good at it. She loved to play fiercely competitive bridge. He loved to dance. She loved to dance. He loved small black dogs. She loved small black dogs. And here's the small black dog. They brought the black dog together. And my wife points out that that is the ultimate expression of true love. <laughs> and there's uh, two uh, shots of Telek the dog. Why did they name it Telek, which is kind of an unusual name? They named it after Telegraph Cottage, where the two of them lived together <laughs> for four years. And he had a whole official family. You know, he had an orderly and a valet and a signal corps man. And they all got together when he was running for president and all this stuff came out about Kay and, their, and all the official family. No, 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 I, I lived in the house too. They just, he, she was the chauffeur, that's all. <laughs> right, then one, one of them finally was pushed and finally said, well, I mean, I was his dresser when he, when he got up in the morning. I walked into his bedroom and he and held out his underwear for him to step into. I would have known. <laughs> and then there was this pause. And the guy says, unless, of course, they were awfully discreet. <laughs> they weren't discreet. They lived openly as a man and wife would live uh, because they were truly in love with each other. But keep in mind what's about to come. Oh, here they are out on the town together. Uh, here's Ike, here's Kay, here's Omar Bradley, this is Kay's mother, and guess who this is? That's John Eisenhower, his son. Talk about openly. Mamie's back in Washington the whole time. She never came across the pond. She stayed the whole war in Washington. Uh, this, is, this is John's date. She has disappeared from history. Nice lady, right? Yeah. Very nice lady. She, uh, she liked dogs. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, the only real distinction between the two of them is that Kay got there first. Uh, I, I have been fortunate to uh, correspond recently with the historian Jean Edward Smith, or I should say Jean Edward Smith, because uh, even though it's J-E-A-N, he's a man, uh, he wrote uh, he published in 2012 a biography of Eisenhower that of the five or six that I've read recently <coughs> strikes me as the best. And uh, he said there isn't any doubt that from the day he went off to West Point, Eisenhower was a ladies man. He was gorgeous, he was playful, uh, he was uh, just a playboy. But I would say from everything that I've read and all the photographs I've seen, he and Kay were truly in love with each other. They had a um, connection, a, uh, a real connection of a very, very affectionate. Uh, oh, here they are. Oh, they hardly knew each other, right? <laughs> she was just the chauffeur. Yeah, here they are. Uh, and this is uh, uh, a woman whose name I forget. She and her husband were. Uh, very senior, either in the military or in the political side, I forget which, is completely open, just completely open. So here we come to the fascinating part of the story. Well, it's all pretty fascinating. Right? 
to, you know, in the next five classes, we're going to have to get serious, but <laughs> here. In late 1945, the war is over. Uh, Marshall says, um, uh, Ike, you're going to be uh, my successor. You're going to be the next uh, Army Chief of Staff. He says, uh, actually, George, uh, I'd like to stay in England, <laughs> period. <clears throat> Full stop. And, uh, uh, Mar and, and the implication is that he wants to divorce maybe and marry Kay. And there's some other evidences of that. Marshall said, you do that and I will make you miserable for the rest of your life. <laughs> and they did this in letters because, uh, or cables, back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, later, when all of this, you know, decades later, again, the official Eisenhower family forms Fortress <laughs> Eisenhower. No, 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 couldn't possibly. Do you know that they took pictures? You're going to see them in a moment. And there was an army unit that was uh, delegated to airbrush K out of all of these <laughs> official photographs. So, you know, as part of this whole Fortress Eisenhower, it never happened, right? It just never happened. It, you know, does it remind you of, of uh, the Soviet Union when they, they did the, the same thing, right? Uh, so the impact of Marshall's letter on Eisenhower was stunning was absolutely stunning. Um, Eisenhower turned on a dime. As much as I truly believe that he truly loved Kay Summersby and wanted to spend the rest of his life with her, when Marshall laid it out and drew a line in the sand, Eisenhower turned on a dime. Kay Summersby first understood that there was a problem when because she, she's his gatekeeper. She's his chief of staff, in effect, and his appointment secretary, right? She gets the telex from Washington saying, uh, we, you know, in official Washingtonese bureaucraties, we have made the following arrangements for Ike's official family to, uh, you'll be on this flight, you'll be at this hotel you, to return to Washington on this and this date, and here are the following, A, B, C, and she's looking, you know, for her name. It's not on the list. She goes to find Ike. Ike's gone. Ike's on a plane and has left her a letter. It reads, Dear Miss Summersby, I cannot tell you what a wonderful contribution you have made to the war effort and what a pleasure it's been working for you, working with you, uh, and I wish you a happy life and uh, goodbye. Jean Edward Smith prints the letter, and his next line is as follows. He said, General Patton would have given a warmer goodbye to his horse. <laughs> <laughs> Ike, remember what his son John said after that pause, 85% ice cold, right? He, you know, in the culture of the times, you want to get to be president of the United States, no divorces, no affairs, you know, bup, 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 bup. that's it. So uh, she disappears until much later. But we'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> All during the war, Ike is uh, working with and socializing with and hobnobbing with the top brass in both Britain and the United States. Um, and as you can tell, he, he's uh, not shy. Uh, this is a guy who is now accustomed to dealing with the highest command on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, the same thing with Churchill. Um, they're so close. And of course, uh, FDR is a ladies' man too. I mean, it goes without saying, uh, which is really amazing given his situation. <laughs> Get this, in 44, in the middle of the most busy part of the war from the Americans' point of view, FDR gets a private bill passed making Kay Summers be an American citizen and appointing her a captain, awarding her a commission, a captain's commission in the United States Army. Mm -hmm. The comment for, for all of you out there in television land was, she deserves it. <laughs> yes. she, it's hard not to be cynical, 
But the truth is, she was a highly effective uh, aide de camp. Uh, normally, you have a colonel playing that role for a three or four star general. And she was the colonel. You could say that the captain's commission was a demotion. Uh, FDR liked K a lot. <laughs> there are some diaries from people who were in the same room with them that make it clear that he was smitten too. Now, you probably noticed that she wasn't a conventional beauty, but she must have had something very, very special about her personality, her outward affect, uh, and her um, uh, command of a room. She, she, yes, sir? Wasn't she engaged during the war and then uh, yes. towards the end he was killed? Actually, towards the beginning. Didn't? Uh, well, uh, let's put it this way. She was engaged to a, a Brit an army captain. Uh, it was uh, in the beginning of Eisenhower's period, but of course, remember, England had been in the war from September of 39. So he had been away in combat for a few years. Uh, some people said to her, you know, Kay, you don't seem very much broken up about the fact that your fiance just got killed. And she said, honestly, I hardly knew him. We got engaged in a big hurry when he was about to be shipped overseas. I never really knew the guy, and he's been absent from my life you know, for several years. I'm not happy he's dead, but it's hard for me to grieve the way I would grieve for a loved one because we were just two kids who, you know. Yes, yes. In the, one of the early pictures you showed of her, she had on a wedding ring. Yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. That's an interesting point. I really don't know the answer to that. She did get married many years later. We'll talk about that. Uh, Eisenhower went over, as you said, as an aide to Marshall. He was a colonel. He was advanced very, very, very quickly within a year or two. Yes. When, when they sent him back in June of, uh, of 42, 42, 42, right after Pearl Harbor, uh, in his new position, they had to make him a two-star general. And then they made him a three-star, then a four-star, then a five-star. That's when it was that appointment to go and, and head uh, American forces in uh, Great Britain. Uh, and there weren't very many then. You know, he was sent really to organize it and get it uh, built up. But um, that's when they really jumped him up. I'm going to ask you to hang on for a second, all right? Because we're, we're, we're trying to cover a lot of ground here. Uh, wherever Ike went, Kay went. Churchill loved her. Now here's the real question. Uh, here you see her in the uh, front row, uh, right at, uh, below Ike and Churchill. And uh, so uh, despite, despite 50 years of historians and Eisenhower family saying, no, 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 I say, not only do I say yes, 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 I say, who cares? A lot of the focus has been on, you know, did they actually have sex? Who gives a damn? She was much younger. What's undeniable is that for almost four years, they lived openly just as a loving husband and wife would live together. As open and complete, they, their lives were filled with each other every day from early in the morning till late at night uh, in just the public part of their relationship. Uh, the important question, in my mind, is whether Kay was a mole planted by Churchill to keep tabs on what's going on inside the American military. This corpse was certainly worth the money. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's so Churchillian. It's just what Winnie would do. And of course, there's no record of it because there doesn't need to be a record. Uh, and you know, why did she show up at the airport? 
ninety. He needed a yeah, and, and there were a million possibilities. You know, the, the motor pool included a lot of guys. So I asked Gene Edward Smith just a few days ago. I said, "So, uh, has anybody ever thought about this?" And there's a pause, and then he says, "Well, there's no record of it." I said. Dr. Smith, that's not what I asked. <laughs> he says, it's certainly something that Churchill would take delight in doing, but it's simply impossible to say. Um, the, you could really uh, argue either way. Um, the, it's hard to imagine that because of the intensely close relationship between the American uh, generals and admirals in London and the British generals and admirals. I mean, they were very close. They see each other every day. And she's right there, right there in his inner office every day, that she wouldn't have uh, plenty of interaction with her British counterparts. Uh, but uh, Dr. Smith uh, has spent years in the archives, something that I have to say I have not done, and uh, life is short. Uh, and he says, and, and you're going to see in a, in a minute or two uh, that uh, he's come up with some remarkable stuff. He says there's just no record one way or another of it. Yes, sir. But Churchill was British. He wouldn't do anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Touche. Yeah. Absolutely. So we can, then it's clear, thank you very much, it's clear we can move on. So uh, he chooses Ike to command Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa. I'm going to skip over this other to, than to focus you on the fact we weren't very good at it. Thank goodness we weren't uh, landing on beaches controlled by the Wehrmacht. Uh, we, but we learned a lot of, we, the Americans, learned a lot of very, very painful very painful lessons. Uh, Ike was in a command post that the British had created for him inside the Rock of Gibraltar, inside the rock, uh, and feeling uh, very left out of it. Uh, uh, here they are actually coming ashore. Uh, and they came ashore at three different points, spread around the entire western horn of Africa. Uh, the British thought it was idiotic from a military point of view, it was idiotic. Uh, over a thousand miles spread out of the three points of the invasion. Um, uh, but it worked because most of the resistance was from the uh, French, the Vichy French. And Eisenhower was pretty good at working out the politics and having them, in effect, surrender pretty quickly. Um, here's a good shot of. Uh, guys coming ashore. I'm going to show you another shot a little later that will give you a sense of what it's like uh, to assault. Do we have any people who have been in a uh, combat assault, like on an island or a beachhead? Uh, you're all too young. OK. Uh, so the success of Torch was followed by uh, the, in the successful invasion of Sicily, uh, then the successful invasion of um, Italy, uh, the word successful being applicable only to the landing, because Hitler at that point decided, well, not so fast, and he sent the Wehrmacht down to oppose the Americans and the British. And uh, we had, a, as most of you probably know, we had an extremely tough time uh, fighting up the boot of Italy uh, because the uh, German troops were. That was about the same time that the invasion was. But the uh, Eisenhower came out smelling like a rose, and uh, uh, Churchill and, um, Eis and uh, FDR get together, and they decide that their first choice to head Operation Overlord, which is going to be the invasion of uh, Western Europe, uh, the invasion of France, is not going to be uh, led by General George Marshall. Marshall takes it like a man. It had been everything that he had sought would be the 
that would be the capstone of his career. And they decide on uh, um, Eisenhower as the leader. And this is the night before D-Day. Uh, this is about as close to combat as Eisenhower has ever gotten. Uh, and uh, uh, Marshall uh, was persuaded that he had to do his duty. Well, number one, he was just this incredibly disciplined guy. When FDR says to him, look, George, when it comes right down to it, I don't feel safe with you out of the country. If I can't reach you and have you come into my office in 15 minutes, the country is not as safe as it should be. So you have to stay in Washington. It's hard to say no to, to that. Here's D-Day. I actually think this is not a photograph. I think it's a painting. But the reason I'm giving it to you is that it gives you a sense of how massive it really was. And what you're seeing is the point of the spear. And what's at the other end of the spear is three years of Eisenhower's planning, organization, training, uh, and figuring out who the right guys are to lead uh, the way. Uh, it's really, despite the fact that he's never uh, been in combat in his whole life, it really is a massive tribute to him that he was able to pull this off. And that is not to denigrate the importance of each individual man on the beach. As you can tell from this photograph, this guy right here is three or four or five seconds away from calling out to the ferryman here, lower the ramp. And at the moment that you see there are machine gun bullets that have zeroed in on this ramp. The only thing between those bullets and these guys is this ramp. And his job is to yell, lower the ramp. All right? And that's just one moment in a combat soldier's life. It's really, uh, I, I just think it's important we not lose sight of the different world that we live in. Here he is with uh, Bradley and Patton. Uh, Patton, of course, caused enormous trouble, but Patton also bailed him out. Uh, the, the one time that Eisenhower tried to take over the running of the war, uh, he spread the lines out so widely and thinly that the last gasp of the German Wehrmacht in World War II was the Battle of the Bulge, where they broke through, for those of you who remember, exactly through the Ardennes forest, where they had broken through uh, in, um, in uh, early May of 1940, when they broke through the French lines so decisively through that impassable forest uh, that the French essentially collapsed. Uh, and, uh, they did it again. And uh, I think you can say uh, two good things about Eisenhower and Patton. When, when they fully realized the extent of the breakout uh, through the Ardennes, almost everybody involved was just stunned. They literally, I mean, it was such a, they hadn't picked up the fact that uh, the Germans had massed such a huge army to do the breakthrough. And they were just open-mouthed and paralyzed, everybody, except Eisenhower. Eisenhower called together these guys, sat them down around a map, and says, here's how we're going to do this. We're going to do X, we're going to do Y, we're going to do Z. You are going to do this right now. You're going to follow up with this tomorrow. Then you're going to do this. And what he had to do with Patton, and what Patton did brilliantly, Patton's army, if you figure, here's the, the line. Well, it's actually like this, a vertical line. And the allies are uh, on the western side trying to go this way. And uh, here's the German army. And it's more of an arc like this. And Patton was in the middle of a drive <coughs> north and east. And he had, you know, his, he, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of men that were pushing north and east. And in order to contain the bulge and cut it off at its narrowest point, he had to take his whole army and turn them 
so that they were moving this way into the gap that the Germans had created. I'm no military uh, strategist, but I have read often that turning an army is incredibly difficult. Napoleon uh, did it once brilliantly, I'm told, and Patton did it in a blizzard. This was in the winter uh, of 44. Uh, it was a particularly bitter cold winter, and he pulled it off brilliantly so that uh, and then Eisenhower had other armies on the other side, and they all pinched off <coughs> the advance. So this advancing German army suddenly was cut off from its supply line. And ultimately, quite literally, they ran out of gas. Uh, they had hoped to capture um, a Dutch port where there would be <coughs> gasoline, uh, and they didn't quite get that far. And uh, a lot of men died on both sides. Uh, a lot of them. Well, I think. 100,000 Germans died in the attempt. And it was really the last gasp. Uh, and then um, uh, this guy uh, has been completely forgotten. But in fact, he was one of the most important people. He was like a super quartermaster. He's the guy in the United States who organized getting all the materiel, all the armaments, all the bullets, all the uniforms, all the boots, all the cannon getting it manufactured, getting it delivered, getting it shipped overseas to the right place at the right time, worldwide, worldwide, anticipating who would need what when, getting it in the pipeline. I mean, th this is a superhero of World War II. Indeed, during the war, uh, Life magazine put him on the cover. Uh, he was very well known during the war, but now he's completely forgotten. He didn't earn four stars uh, for nothing. Uh, there's a, uh, Eisenhower said, who's the most important general you have? That's who he said, Somerville. All right? This has nothing to do with our story, but I had never seen this photograph. Anybody seen this photograph? This is supposedly the last photograph taken of Adolf Hitler uh, before he shot him. So, that's the bunker. Uh, you know, I've already forgotten. I think, I think Google Images, I think. Um, but I'm not 100% sure. I just came across it. Uh, you can tell how old I am. I just came across it a few weeks ago. I've already, I've already forgotten. Uh, but I think it's legit. Uh, this is, um, I think, a few days. The bunker is already externally in ruins, having been pounded uh, by uh, Russian artillery. Uh, so you're looking at one of the last moments of his life, thank goodness. Now here they are on May 7 for the official surrender ceremony, all these guys. Uh, and uh, wh what is this piece of hair here? That's the one in the back. Hello, Kay. <laughs> Everywhere. Everywhere Ike went, Kay went. Everywhere. <laughs> and here he is with Marshal Zhukov and the uh, French uh, uh, General de Tassigny and uh, uh, Montgomery. No, that is not. It looks like him, but it's not. De Gaulle was much taller. Yep, that's right. Uh, and what's interesting is that. Uh, in the last months of the war, uh, the, at the level of generals, the uh, Americans and the Russians became very, very friendly. Not friendly in the sense of, uh, you know, I love you, but friendly in the sense of very close cooperation and a very close <coughs> understanding of each other's problems. And, uh, uh, and they did socialize, too. The, uh, this picture was used by McCarthyites to prove that Eisenhower was a uh, commie. Oh, oh, it's obvious he, he's making nice with uh, uh, the guy who in the 50s was the uh, uh, defense minister of the Soviet Union. What could be clearer? Yeah, uh, having a nice, you know, what could be clearer? And you thought it was all a conspiracy? He says to, Ike says to Zhukov, you know, uh, in your last big push, uh, across Poland, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm marveling at how you got your huge tank armies 
through those enormous uh, minefields that the Germans laid out as they were <coughs> retreating. Uh, it just makes no sense to me. Uh, how, how do you get you know, tanks at the army level of concentration through these huge minefields? And Zhukov <coughs> looks up in surprise and says, well, we sent the infantry in first. <laughs> Ike comes home and the, thanks to George Marshall, really, who is a very shy, <coughs> reticent man, they decide that Ike is going to be the symbol <coughs> of American military prowess and victory. And he comes home to a, a homecoming that establishes <coughs> him as the icon of the American military effort. You might think, well, what about MacArthur? MacArthur was too egotistical for anybody to handle. He was just too much. Uh, Ike had that. By the way, does this remind you of someone? Yeah. But what we, what we have to stay in touch with is how immensely popular he was across the board, absolutely across the board. But here's where I again want to remind you, based on you know, a number of the things we've looked at already, how uh, behind that grin was an intense self-discipline, a self-discipline that could say to Kay Summersby, sayonara, despite the fact that I am convinced that he truly loved her and wanted to spend the rest of his life with her. If something became more important, Sayonara. Right? His son John, 85% ice cold. Right? But John, John was with him when he died. He was the last sure. with him. Yes. Ike didn't feel that he had a bad relationship with John. But I'll tell you this. When John got his chance to see combat in Korea, and Ike got told by John in no uncertain terms, keep your damn hands off of my career, and served in combat in Korea, very honorably. Ike said, well, then I got to tell you something. If you get captured by the North Koreans and the Chinese, you have to commit suicide. Because you can't put me as president in the position of, all right. And he said, and that's what Stalin did with his son. Stalin. And that's true. That is true. Stalin's first son was captured by the Germans. And the Germans, once they figured out who he was, uh, sent a note. Um, across the lines to Stalin and said, if you'll give us General Paulus back, who the, who the Russians captured at Stalingrad, we'll give you your son back. And basically, uh, Stalin said, his actual words, because it's, it was done in a, a telex or something that's part of the record, his actual words were, you have one of my sons. I have 20 million sons on the front lines. If you want to give them all back to me, I'll talk to you, period. And uh, his son either committed suicide or was murdered in a prison of war camp. The official story is that he threw himself on the electrified barbed wire intentionally. Uh, nobody really knows what happened. Yes, sir? Where was Mamie Durek? Yeah. Washington, D.C. Uh, so the, Ward, the Wardman Hotel. And is that the period when she became an alcoholic? Uh, most people say that her supposed alcoholism is not true. That she was a drinker the way, you know, heavy social drinkers of the 1940s and 50s were, but that she was definitely not an alcoholic, and that she had an inner ear problem, uh, which my mother had. Uh, late in life that caused her to be a little shaky on her feet because every time she stood up and looked down, you know, and some of you may actually know people. Uh, the same problem. So I, I can say to you, I don't know if she was an alcoholic, but I can tell you if she was, she had good reason to be. <laughs> Uh, when they made him commander-in-chief of NATO 
couple of years later. We'll, in fact, let's keep, you know, we gotta, we gotta move. We're, we're, you're good. Yeah. Uh, so Truman twice offers him the Democratic presidential nomination on a silver platter. In 48, uh, in, in, actually in 47, in pr preparation for 48, he says, look, I'll be your vice president. We'll run together. Because nobody had any idea whether Eisenhower was a Republican or a Democrat, but they knew he was the most popular man in the country. And a guy like Truman, who had worked closely with him, knew that he was presidential timber. He, you know, T-I-M-B-R-E. He, he had the stuff. He had this internationalist view. In fact, the truth is, as we'll see over the course of the uh, next five classes, with a few exceptions, most of his views were very similar to Truman's. Very similar. He decides, no, I'm not going to run for president. I'm going to become president of Columbia University. Mm -hmm. Most Columbia faculty, when they first heard Eisenhower is going to be our president, they thought Milton. Milton, who had become first president of Kansas State. Then he became president of Penn State. And then he became president, after this, of Johns Hopkins. And they thought, oh, great. This is super. Milton's a great guy. Turned out to be Ike. And if you think it was a small convocation when he was <laughs> and let me tell you something, this I guarantee this is a piece of the convocation. They couldn't they didn't have a, a, a camera that could get a big enough shot. It was the stadium? Uh, no, this is the main Columbia campus. Uh, this is Broadway right here, 116th Street, but of course it's closed off. Uh, Butler Library. Uh, this is uh, but it Woo, big. So then, he's, he's not a very effective president of Columbia. Let's put it that way. He, he, he was still a military guy, and the faculty of Columbia University didn't take orders. Right? Uh, and then uh, uh, Truman forms NATO. And we've got to create, says Truman, uh, a NATO armed forces of these 12 countries. Uh, the only person, says Truman to Eisenhower, the only person who can do that, who has the skills and the prestige and the experience to put together a multilateral international force that's effective is you, Ike. So please do it. And that's when he gets the five stars. Um, General of the Armies. Uh, they, did, they did that for MacArthur, which you can argue about. They did it for Blackjack Pershing. They did it for Ulysses Grant. I think. Hap Arnold, too. Hap, was it Hap? Arnold. Yeah, it could be. The head of the Army Air Force. Yeah. <coughs> the reason I'm showing you this is because this is a 1950 picture. Look how slender and youthful and vigorous okay. this guy is. 60 years old. That's right. Right? <laughs> you say he's smoking? You sure? In 1949, his doctor said, you can either keep smoking and be dead in a year, or you can give it up today. Same discipline, same kind of turning on a dime. 1949, he took the pack of cigarettes out of his pocket, put it down, never smoked again. Uh, yeah, I can't explain that. Like Obama. So one of, my, one of my dates is clearly wrong. Take your pick. I got the right decade, didn't I? But it is remarkable what the presidency did to him. I mean, because I'm sure you'll see pictures of him later in the course. Uh, for much of uh, his presidency, he was aging fast, very fast. And uh, so he's back in Europe, uh, and uh, this is not a shy guy. This is the Secretary of State of the United States getting told where to get off by General Eisenhower. Uh, and, I, and by the way, I don't mean that critically. I mean. This is a guy who's used to heavy-duty command. Right? 
This is at the exact moment when he learns that Truman has fired MacArthur. <laughs> <laughs> wow, great picture. That is terrific. <laughs> By the way, I'll jump forward a little. Later, when uh, he becomes President of the United States, or is about to become President of the United States, and MacArthur has clearly been left on the sidelines, somebody asks MacArthur, uh, well, what do you think of Ike? And he says, best damn clerk I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, we're at quarter of. Uh, do we have to call it quits? I have, I can stop here, you see? These, here, we'll do this very quickly. Lucius Clay was a general uh, who he came to trust during World War II, had a big business career, uh, became uh, Lehman Brothers CEO after he was CEO of Continental Can, uh, became <coughs> High Commissioner of Germany uh, at Eisenhower's uh, behest. Uh, probably the guy after the war that he trusted most. I mean, really trusted. Brownell was a Lord Day and Lord lawyer in New York. Uh, in 1944 uh, and 48, he was Tom Dewey's campaign manager, uh, a Republican liberal, right? Back when those things <laughs> existed, right? Uh, he was critical between Clay and, and uh, uh, Brownell. They were critical to persuading Ike that he could do it. Dewey was very, very important as well. Uh, and uh, uh, here's his opposition. Uh, and need we say more? He uh, won in the Lancet. <coughs> now, the question uh, is, and this is as much for Barbara as for anybody, uh, we call it quits? Mm -hmm. Yes? You want another five, ten? ten minutes? Minutes? I just need a bar. Hard. Yeah, raise your hand if you want another ten minutes. Okay, good. And let me tell you why. Because I, uh, what, what I originally did was I had the next 10 minutes at the beginning of class two and I realized as I was going over the whole thing, it, it really belongs as part of this. And class two will start with his presidency. So in, in the first six months of 52, this is six months before the Republican convention, these uh, three guys, four guys actually, Dewey, Lodge, Clay, and Brownell, uh, essentially draft him. Uh, Lodge didn't play as big a role uh, because he ended up in a dogfight for the Massachusetts Senate seat that he occupied in Massachusetts. Some kid named Kennedy was uh, <laughs> running against him, and he didn't survive. <laughs> uh, so he finally decides, and it was no easy decision. After 37 years, or if you count West Point, um, 41 years in the, uh, in the UN, US Army, it was not an easy decision to walk away from the military. But he did. Uh, this is the uh, Chicago Republican Convention. Uh, he brought, Ike came armed with his brothers. Uh, the front runner was Robert Taft, who was the leader of the right wing of the Republican Party. And if I described to you their program, you'd think I was talking about the leader of the Tea Party today. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, he was the friendly, compassionate face of right wing Republicanism, a very bright guy. Uh, and he thought he had the nomination in the bag. Uh, the notion that somebody could come in at the last second and take it away from him. Uh, was completely uh, foreign to his understanding of how American <coughs> politics worked. As you can see, he was isolationist, virulently anti-communist, fortress America, small government, uh, and small-minded. Uh, and I don't mean that as a huge hostile comment. I mean, he just, the difference was that he had spent the war in mid-America and Eisenhower had spent the war uh, on the world stage in London. And Eisenhower, by this time, is a very different guy. He's an internationalist. <coughs> so uh, here's, here's uh, uh, Governor Warren, uh, who became critical, uh, as you'll see in a moment. And it's Stassen, by the way, from uh, Harold Stassen. Minnesota. 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 Minnes
he, I should have put his name up there because Warren in California, Dewey and Stassen together had this block of votes that became critical. Oh, he thought that he was going to be the dark horse, by the way. MacArthur thought, when I stand up and give my speech, I've got the nomination. Well, it didn't happen that way. Joe McCarthy was at the convention. Uh, you can see Eisenhower trying to figure out uh, whether to hold his hand or not. Uh, by, the, by the way, the, he, uh, McCarthy for years underestimated Eisenhower, didn't understand who he was dealing with. This is the way it looked at the oh. end of the first ballot before it had officially closed. The votes had been uh, counted, but it, the ballot was open. And to Taft's amazement, uh, Eisenhower is almost 100 votes ahead. Warren and Stassen and um, a couple others throw their votes to Ike. Wow. And in the, in the before it closes period, so it's all on the first ballot, uh, Eisenhower racks up 845 votes, way over the minimum needed. I think all he had to do was get to uh, 600 something. And, uh, and then, of course, it was by acclamation. Uh, and he accepts his party's nomination. Now, this is just wonderful. He was so unschooled in the American party politics that that night when Brownell is uh, in his hotel room, that just the two of them going over what's going to happen in the morning, he first learns from Brownell that he's expected to just select unilaterally who his vice presidential candidate is tell the convention, and the convention will nominate that guy by acclamation. He had no idea. He thought that the next day the whole process would repeat itself and they'd figure out for him who the vice president would be. He says, fine, my first choice is Governor Warren. They call him up. Governor Warren says, I've been in that place before. I've been considered. I, I lost my chance this time, last time. Thanks, no thanks. And supposedly, supposedly, Ike says, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Thanks for throwing your votes to me. You'll be my first nomination to the US Supreme Court. I don't know that that happened. I, I don't know that. So he turns to Senator Nolan, another California, but Senator Nolan is like second in command to Taft in terms of leadership of the right wing of the Republican Party. Nolan says no. So he turns to the junior senator from California, the communist baiting up and coming young radical right uh, senator. And guess what? <laughs> Look at this. But more, even more important than this, ladies and gentlemen, is look at this. He's got a hold of Ike, and he ain't letting go. <laughs> And here we've got our, uh, our uh, Democratic opposition. You can say a lot of wonderful things about him, but he wasn't a war hero. And this is the moment, the exact moment, when Nixon is told by Nolan that he has got a major league problem with this so-called $18,000 slush fund and that Eisenhower wants him off the ticket. This is the exact moment. This is a photograph taken from his checker speech on TV, which was the first advocacy use of television. You got to remember how early in the television game this is. He, you know, especially given all the criticism of Nixon in his debates with Kennedy, he was brilliant. You might not li have liked him, but he was brilliant in explaining that this wasn't a slush fund. This was used for political expenses. He actually went down a list and explained it all. And then he ran circles around Eisenhower. This is beautiful. Eisenhower had let it be known through intermediaries. Uh, Nixon, time to step aside. Nixon does it. He says, I want to go on TV and explain myself to the American people. And I'll do you right, Eisenhower. I will do you right. Eisenhower thinks, oh, he's going to go on TV, do his mea culpa, and say he's resigning from you know, being the nominee. What he does is he says, I think I'm the best candidate. And at the, this is the end of his checker speech. And if you agree with me, you call the chairman 
of the Republican National Party and you tell him or send him a telegram and he puts up the guy's telephone number <laughs> and just leaves Eisenhower out of the whole equation, you know, in the gutter. Just uh, blah, blah, blah. And they were flooded with calls, uh, all almost uh, a thousand to one in favor of Nixon and Ike had no choice but to leave him on the ticket, despite the fact that he truly didn't want him. Here's Checkers <laughs> with the kids, you know, nice dog. Uh, Ike pledges that uh, if he's elected, he'll go to Korea. Notice he didn't say what he would do. <laughs> and he wins in a landslide. And we start out with eight years <laughs> of the worst hairdo in American history. <laughs> and he goes to Korea. Now to show you what a complete public relations gimmick this was, MacArthur had been fired and Truman replaced him with Matthew Ridgway, who Ike knew very, very well from World War II, respected and trusted enormously. <coughs> Ridgway had given him a complete briefing he was intimately familiar with the situation in Korea. There was no need for him to go, but it made for great pictures. He inspects everything, you know, and he, insp and he inspects with the Americans, he inspects with the, uh, the uh, uh, South Koreans, uh, and he gets to see his son. Uh, let's see, where is John? Here he is eating with the guys, right? Ah, here's John. And this guy, I honestly don't know. This is obviously somebody important. And the result is that he comes back, Eisenhower comes back, and he's made up his mind. We're getting out of Korea just as fast as we can. And that's what he does. He, of course, our troops are still there. But in terms of combat, he ended the combat within four months of assuming the presidency. The armistice was signed, I think, after six months. Uh, Negotiate. Uh, he didn't have to negotiate much. It was almost all there already. It just needed the political will to say, this is not a place we need to be. Here he is with uh, Harry uh, on their way to the inauguration. Uh, uh, if I have time in a minute, I'll tell you why. Uh, it, was, it was one of the worst things that Ike ever did. Uh, Truman had been an enormous supporter of Eisenhower. And he really just tried to put as much distance. The reason these smiles are so ironic, the tradition had been that when, I, when you go to the inaugural, the, the uh, incoming president goes to the White House. The outgoing president invites him in for coffee and tea. They chat for half an hour. Then they get in the car and they go to the inauguration. Eisenhower refused to come in to the White House, made Truman come out to him. Uh, just a pointless snub that was really uncharacteristic of, of uh, Eisenhower uh, and, and angered Truman so deeply that he never got over it, really. Never got over it. Here he is being sworn in, uh, and that's why I wanted to do this last 10 minutes. And I'll tell you why um, Eisenhower's uh, insulting of uh, Truman was so unforgivable. Remember uh, during the war, at the end of the war, he had written to Marshall and said, uh, Dear George, I, I don't want to go home to Mamie. I want to stay here in England and marry Kay. And George had written back saying, you do that and I'll make mincemeat out of you. That exchange of official correspondence was in the Pentagon files when Truman was trying to talk Eisenhower into running in 48 and said, you run as president, I'll step down and I'll run as your vice president. Between the two of us, we're unbeatable. He sent in an aide into the Pentagon <coughs> files, took the two letters out, and ripped them up. Truman did. Truman did. To clear the way for Eisenhower's presidential run, and, and in some way that we don't know, he let Eisenhower knew, know that he had made it safe for him. Truman 
never told that story until he, you know, he outlived Eisenhower. And when he was only a year away from his own death, he told his biographer, Merle Miller, this story. And uh, Merle Miller put it in the biography. And once again, the official Fortress Eisenhower says, oh, no, 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 that couldn't possibly be true. They would never do that. And besides, the president couldn't get into the archives, and that's all baloney, and then, you know. <laughs> Dr. Smith just wrote to me an oh, by the way. We were having a conversation about something else. An oh, by the way. Yeah, I was just in the FBI archives and found the uh, documentary evidence that it was an FBI man they sent into the archives, the Defense Department archives, to pull out the two letters. There's actually a record of the FBI guy being vetted into the Pentagon to pull out the two files, deliver them to Truman. And he just discovered that within the last few weeks. Man must spend a lot of time in the archives. Eisenhower, I think. The only explanation that Brownell came up with that's in his memoirs, uh, which I can neither tell you I believe it or disbelieve it, it's beyond me. I, I don't operate at those levels, you know? Brownell said that he and others around uh, Eisenhower, guys like um, um, Lucian Clay and Dewey and Brownell himself and others, felt that it was critical in the 52 campaign for Eisenhower to differentiate himself from Truman and Truman's administration. Because the truth was that on so many major issues, their views were either like this or like that or pretty, pretty close, including, including uh, domestic issues. And they felt it was critical for Eisenhower to be separate because the big attack that they were making on Truman's administration was that it was corrupt. Truman's cronies were getting special deals. There was corruption all through the communists in the government, you know, left over from the 30s. Uh, and Eisenhower, if, if it's true, to his shame, did that. He made a number of speeches during the campaign, despite the fact that he was running against Adlai Stevenson, in which the thrust of his speech was attacking Truman for corruption. And sometimes he would forget to say the Truman administration, and he would say Truman. And if there's one thing that I can guarantee you is that however corrupt uh, the administration may or may not have been, Truman was as straight an arrow as you're going to get, despite the fact that he came out of the Pendergast machine of Kansas City. He was a straight guy. And those speeches led to Truman saying, you know, that Ike has some nerve. That's about all he said. Ike has some nerve, uh, and uh, you should vote for Adlai Stevenson. And it was Eisenhower who got the worst of it. Uh, in a way that I can't explain because uh, he really owed Truman an enormous debt. And, it, and the final step, excuse me one second, the final step was when he stayed in the car on inauguration day and refused to walk inside and sit down and have a cup of coffee with him. And I can't explain that because it's very unlike uh, Eisenhower's methodology. Even if you accept John's statement that he's 85% ice cold. He was an extraordinarily effective uh, politician in the small piece sense. And this is completely uh, at odds with it, totally at odds with it. So on that note, I leave you and we will pick up next time. Very good.